Judges chapter 13 is where we'll be this morning as we continue walking through God's Word, reading God's Word together, and then just unpacking a little bit of what we read as we sort of tell the narrative of where God's Word is taking us from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And my prayer is, is that as you're reading this, you're starting to pick up on how important and how miraculous God's Word is and how it was put together to get us to a place to not only tell us the story of human history, but to guide us towards the way God had made a way for us, which is that in Christ Jesus. On this Palm Sunday, we remember that moment when Jesus went into those city gates for one purpose, and that purpose is to be crucified for our sins. And all of God's Word is getting us there. Here's why. Because we need a Savior. Amen? We need a Savior because of what we learned in Genesis. What did we learn in Genesis? Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God. And when they disobeyed God, sin entered into the world. And what was imputed to us is an unrighteousness that comes from their disobedience. And so now every man and woman is born with a nature to sin, a natural inclination to disobey God. That's not what it was like in Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1 and 2, every human being that would have been born out of Adam and Eve's obedience to God to be fruitful and multiply, every human at that point who would have been born would have been born with a nature not to disobey God, a righteous nature, a godly nature. It would just be who they are. And that was God's purpose. That was God's plan for Adam and Eve to multiply and to fill the earth with worshipers of God. Now, as we know, Children that are born, the generations after, are born to disobey God or with a nature to disobey God. And so now something has to happen because God wants people to worship him. And God is going to make a way for men and women to worship him. And so what happens is God begins to set in motion a plan to redeem mankind back to himself. But as we get to Christ, we see this law that's introduced, this law that would create a way for mankind to be moral and to live moral lives, to see God as holy, and now they're going to live their lives with a standard. Now they know who God is and what God expects from them. They also know how to interact with one another, all for the purpose to proclaim the name of God to the world. We see this all through the Old Testament. But we know this about the nation of Israel. Even though God had promised them this promised land that we talked about in this last series, the nation of Israel, as they journeyed towards this promised land, this nature, this inclination to disobey God and to not believe God, rears its head over and over and over. Even though God at every turn displays for the nation of Israel his might and his glory, even though at every turn God tells the nation of Israel by his actions and his word, you can trust me that my plan, it really is the plan. And if you deviate from this plan, it's not going to go well for you. And so we see these miraculous things happen in the nation of Israel. We see moments of fire and, and cloud and smoke, the voice of God and thunder and miraculous things taking place at every turn. And yet, the nation of Israel continues to disobey God. And so God then leaves them to wander in the wilderness. A whole generation is going to die off before the next generation can see the promised land. And that's what happened. As a matter of fact, the only one in that generation that was able to even see the promised land was Moses. And that was when God brought Moses to the mountaintop in his grace and allowed him to see the promised land. And so now a generation has died. Now the nation of Israel is heading over into the promised land. And Joshua is going to lead them into this promised land. And this promised land uh, sort of crossing, if you will, is not going to just be a walk in the park. It's a conquest. They're going to encounter nations and people and and demonic forces behind the scenes that are enemies of God who inhabit this land. We talked about this in, the, the, uh, in Jericho. We saw this, this first conquest, this first battle, and how God showed up. Well, the nation of Israel, if you continue to read with us, they continue to press through the promised land, and they're on their way, and they're journeying, and they're conquest. And now they're beginning to live life in the land, just as God promised them. And yet they're still enemies of God, and there's still groups of people that are going to oppose them. 
And so now they're living their life in this land, and that's where we find ourselves from a 30,000-foot view in the book of Judges. What God is going to do in the book of Judges is he is going to raise up men and women, these individuals who are going to deliver and be a voice of God to deliver their fellow countrymen out of the arms of oppressors that are going to come in and go out, come in and go out. They're going to exercise, if you will, this sort of saving, liberating activity that was visualized by God. God sees this. He knows it's going to happen. And so he's going to raise up these judges to be a voice to the nation of Israel. And in Judges chapter 13, we're going to look at probably what is, who is the most well-known uh, judge in the book of Judges, and that's the story of Samson. But if you remember, I told you that as you read through the Old Testament and as you follow the nation of Israel and their journey, it's easy to get very frustrated by the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel at every turn seems to just make horrible decisions. Look at verse 13 in chapter 1, or or chapter 13, verse 1. The Israelites again, right? If you circle or underline, it's a great uh, word to circle or underline. I mean, here they are again doing what is evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Philistines for 40 years. The nation of Israel once again makes a decision to disobey God, to not believe God, to not trust God. And so what does God do? Well, God had already promised he's not going to flood the earth again. And so what God does now is is he allows themselves to be oppressed by the Philistines. And this will begin um, 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 uh, hundreds and thousands of years of battles between Israel and, and the Philistines or Palestine today. And so this is the rhythm of the nation of Israel. And this is where it gets frustrating. The nation of Israel sins. They're they're put into captivity by God. This is their, their judgment. Then they repent. Then God delivers. Then God gives them a blessing. And then they sin again. And the whole cycle just continues to repeat over and over and over and over again. We learn two things about the nation of Israel. One, we see ourselves in the nation of Israel, don't we? we? We see the the work and the labor to walk with God. We see um, uh, the man's nature to sin in the nation of Israel, but it certainly should reflect us in many ways. It does. We should be reminded as to our life. And so we don't sort of read this and get sort of this haughty spirit. Like we read this, and, and it's really for me personally, and maybe it is for you. Hopefully it is in some way. It's, it's rather humbling. Because I know I can't look at the nation of Israel, and yes, I know captivity, repentance, uh, deliverance, and blessing. I mean, these are all specific events that take place in the nation of Israel. But spiritually, I feel like this sometimes, don't you? I feel like even what the Apostle Paul would say is that the things he wants to do, he doesn't do. The things he does, he shouldn't do. And it's sort of this cycle of sin, repentance, sin, repentance. And as we press into God all the more, it humbles us more and more and more. Because here's what we learn about God. Within the nation of Israel and his activity among them, with them and towards them, and even in our own lives. Here's what we we learn. We learn that God is really patient with his children. How many of you guys are glad God was patient with you this week? Yeah. Yeah. And and that says so much about God because we tend to be people who are impatient. It's just part of this nature that we're born with, to be impatient and to react and to respond and to do things that we we shouldn't do. It reminds me of the story where uh, this man would go to work and his wife would call him a lot and they would have these conversations and he would just get really frustrated, impatient. He would say things he he shouldn't say and be really, you know, sort of quick-tempered on the phone and it would just really mess up their day. And then one day she called and he said, listen, honey, I am very, very busy. I need you to do two things. One, I need you to not be negative and I need you to be quick. And so she paused for a second and the most, the most positive, jovial uh, tone that, and, and cadence that she could say this sentence, she said, well, I learned today that the airbags in our new BMW, they work. <laughs> we battle this all the time. 
But what we learn about God is that God is patient with his children. The point of Israel's conquest, now think about this, and this is where this, this sort of rub starts to happen. The point of Israel's conquest in this promised land is to defeat the enemies of God. To, to do it God's way, to listen to God, do what God tells them to do, but to, to defeat the enemies of God and cultivate a life and multiply and fill this land in a way that honors God. You can, in some ways, parallel this and go back to even Genesis 1 and 2, which was God's original intent and plan for mankind. Multiply, fill the earth with worshipers. Now the nation of Israel sort of embodies this, this group of people that are not unlike our Adam and Eve in their commission to take this land, cultivate it, multiply, fill the earth with worshipers. Only now they're filling the earth with worshipers, and we'll see this later on, that, that have a, a, a sort of innate inclination to deny and to disobey God. So it's a battle. This is what sin does. But instead of completing their conquest, and their conquest is to take the land and multiply and fill it, instead of doing that, they start to settle. They start to, to live in the land in a way where they would even adopt the cultures around them not fulfilling their conquest, as in Deuteronomy 7, as God sends them off to do. And you can read that. Go read in Deuteronomy 7 at some point. Remind yourself of, of what God tells them to do. Go there. Listen, don't marry. Don't, don't get involved in their culture. But you go there and you take the land. And so they don't do it. And now we find ourselves in Judges where we see God raising up towards the nation of Israel once again because of their disobedience. They are doing evil again in the sight of God. And this Samson judge is going to be raised up. Judges, let's look at um, verses 1 through 5 in Judges chapter 2. Listen to what they say. And it'll be on the screen. We'll get to 13 in a second. The angel of the Lord went up to Gilgal to Bacham and said... I brought you out of Egypt, led you into the land I had promised your ancestors. I also said, I will never break my covenant with you. You are not to make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You are to tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed me. What you have done, therefore, I now say, I will not drive out these people before you. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a trap for you. And when the angel of the Lord has spoken these words to all the Israelites, the people wept out loudly, so they named that place Bacham and offered sacrifices there to the Lord. This is what they did that was evil in the sight of God. They disobeyed the commission and the command from Deuteronomy 7 to take this land and to not settle in it and let the culture invade their culture. But instead, God wanted them to fill the earth with worshipers. But now they begin to adopt. Now they begin to marry. Now they begin to settle. And so because of this sin, God then raises up judges to communicate with them and to deliver them from these thorns, if you will, that are going to rear their head. And this is where Judges 13 comes in. We'll start in verse 2. There was a certain man from Zorah from the family of Dan. If you've been to Israel with us, we've been to Dan. It's a great place whose name was Manoah. His wife was unable to conceive and had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, although you are unable to conceive and have no children, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now please be careful not to drink wine or beer or to eat anything unclean, for indeed you will conceive and give birth to a son. You must never cut his hair because the boy will be a Nazarite to God from birth, and he will begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines." The nation of Israel is being oppressed by the Philistines. God intervenes and tells this woman who is unable to have children and not have children, hey, don't you worry, you're going to have a son, and this son is going to be a Nazarite, and this son is going to deliver you from the oppression of the Philistines. This is great news. Not unlike the news as Jesus enters into the gates, Jerusalem, for the purpose to save, for the purpose of deliver deliverance. Here is Samson, this promised son to deliver the nation of Israel from the oppression of the Philippines, or the Philippines, the Philistines. <laughs> wow. 
That'd be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> now, Samson is a Nazarite, and that means he's going to make a vow as a Nazarite. And that vow is going to consist of three things. One, he, can, he can't touch anything from a vineyard. No wine, no drink, no alcohol. He can't do no grapes. He cannot be even near a vineyard. He can't eat anything from a dead animal. Can't touch him. That will defile him. It will, it will end his vow. And he can't cut his hair. These are the three things that this Nazarite vow would consist of. And there's details in, in the middle of it all, but that's the big picture of it all. And so Samson's mother is told the same, hey, while you're pregnant, you don't do these things because you're about to deliver, and he's going to be a, a Nazarite from birth. And the story of Samson, when you take that in, in, into the, the, the sort of big picture of it all, Samson is meant to deliver. What's he meant to deliver? He's meant to deliver a word to the people to help them get out of the oppression of the Philistines. And the reason they're in the, uh, under the oppression of the Philistines in the first place is because of their disobedience and because of their sort of uh, uh, melting in with the culture, if you will, and not completing their conquest. And so this is a very complicated story. Samson is generally like one of the kids' stories. How many of you guys grew up in Sunday school? You grew up in Sunday school? Remember the story of Samson in Sunday school, right? I, I, I'd be willing to bet the whole story of Samson, at least when I was a kid, I, don't, I just remember Samson, strong guy, pillars, pull him down, everybody dies, God wins. Oh, but there's so much more to it. Because Samson's a very complicated story. It's a very complicated man. There are things that happen with Samson that cause you to scratch your head and wonder, wow, is this guy, he's a judge? Like He's, he's the hope of the nation of Israel under the oppression of the, the Philistines? One commentary said this, said, We have one of the strangest stories of the Old Testament in the story of Samson. It is a story of great opportunity and a disastrous failure in the case of a man who might have wrought a great deliverance but failed. Samson's life is all about us learning these guardrails that keep us from wrecking our lives. This is the lesson that we learn from, from the story of Samson and how it applies to us personally. That God gives us guardrails, and these guardrails are meant uh, to, to help us not wreck our life. And so Samson's life is a case study as to how not to live your life. Yes, God comes through, but Samson is a mess. And so what I want to do this morning very quickly is I want to give you three guardrails that we learn from the life of Samson. And this is sort of going to be the big picture of his story. And so we're going to hit 13, 14, 15, even 16 as we unpack this complicated story of Samson, this judge who is meant to deliver the nation of Israel out of the oppression of the Philistines. I'm, I'm saying that really slow because in my mind it's still, it's still uh, Philippines. So I'm trying to go really slow with that. So what did Samson do, and what can we learn? What did he do? Well, one, let me point your attention to this, is that Samson disregarded the people in his life. 14, flip over there really quick. Let's read the first four verses of chapter 14. We already know the announcement of Samson's birth, and we know that the announcement of Samson's birth would be that he's going to deliver them from the oppression of, of, of the Philistines, and he's going to be a Nazarite. But then things start to happen that sort of contradict that. And God has put people in his life, naturally, to help guide him, and yet he disregards them. Verse 1, Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman there. He went back and told his father and his mother, I have seen a young Philistine woman in Timnah. Now go get her for me as a wife. Red flag number one. Already Samson is not going in the direction he should be going as a judge who was meant to deliver the nation of Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. But his father and mother said to him, can't you find a young woman among your relatives or among any of our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines for a wife? The people in his life saying, whoa, 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 Samson. No, 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 Samson, let's come here, come here, come here. You need to go this way. Right? What does Samson do? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now, 
Samson is making a, a bad choice, and we're going to see this choice made over and over again in his life. But where is God in the midst of all this? Because verse 4 could be problematic. Let's read it. Now, his father and mother did not know this was from the Lord. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? Who wanted the Philistines to provide an opportunity for a confrontation. At that time, the Philistines were ruling Israel. Now, this does not mean that God is contradicting himself or going against his own command and his own desire for Samson to, to, to be a voice and to, be, to live in, in the standard that he's called him to. This is not God sort of changing his mind as to the direction, but here's what God is doing. God is working behind the scenes in spite of Samson's decisions. He knows his heart. He knows what he wants. And so God begins to plot behind the scenes. And here's what we learn just in this one moment as he disregards these people and as God works to do what God said he was going to do. God is going to deliver the nation of Israel out of the oppression of the Philistines, whether Samson's involved with it or not. And so here's what we learn, that your disobedience will not stop God's plan to deliver. That at the end of the day, when we take this from a, 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 a very high theological perspective, at the end of the day, our disobedience is not going to stop God from taking the gospel and, and spreading it across the world. Here, here's what happens. When we disobey and we step outside of God's plan for our lives, we are the ones that miss out on the blessing of being a part of God's plan to draw men and women unto himself. But regardless, behind the scenes, God is always working. And this is true in the nation of Israel. With Samson, God is always working behind the scenes of our desires to accomplish his plan. Listen, God is not unaware of our brokenness. He's not unaware of our desires. He's not unaware of our flesh. And so I'm thankful for two things. One, I'm thankful that God is patient with me. And I'm thankful that God is always working behind the scenes of my desires to accomplish his plan. That my flesh and my sinful nature is not the thing holding back God from saving the world. And here's why. The reason is, is the way God saves the world is not through me, but through who? Yeah, Jesus, always the right answer in church, by the way. But through who? Jesus. Through Christ. It's the whole point of the cross. It's the whole point of, of Jesus dying. It's the whole point of the sacrifice. It's the whole point of his, his taking on my sin. And so what we learn about God is even though Samson's making bad decisions, God has already worked around those decisions to accomplish his plan. But what Samson did was disregard the people in his life. And this is true for all of us. God puts people in our lives as guardrails to guide us and direct us. As a parent, I, I know that even now more than ever. Because as a teenager, I didn't need those guardrails, right? My mom and dad didn't know nothing. And now I find myself going, wow, they knew a lot. Teenagers in the room, listen, I love you, but you don't know anything. And I don't mean that to be mean. You're going to walk out all the pastor, you know. But hey, listen, at the end of the day, God has put people in our lives as guardrails. Now, it doesn't always work out that way. Not every teenager has godly influence. Not every person has a godly influence in their life as a child. But here's what's true. You put your faith and trust in Jesus. God will bring those people into your life to guide and direct you. As adults, we need people around us. Even now, I need people around me to, to help guide and direct. And these aren't people I should dis, disregard. I mean, I, my wife is there and friends are there and people that call me and call me out and we have conversations. I need those people in my life because God places those people in our lives as guardrails. You need those people. I can't stress to you enough the importance of you being in a community group at Grand Avenue. I can't express that enough. As a matter of fact, the whole reason we made this sort of switch where we do the 930 service and we do the, um, uh, the, the, the 11 o'clock community groups is so that you would get involved with people. And some of these people become guardrails in your life that God blesses you with. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're not in a community group, 
You should get in a community group. You should try one out. And listen, if you don't like that one, go to a next one. We'll find one. If you can't find one, we'll start one. <laughs> so important and vital to our spiritual health. But, but Samson disregards those people in his life. Big mistake. Big mistake. What else did Samson do? Number two, he disregarded God's commands for his life. Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. You should underline that. Suddenly a lion came roaring at him. Now this is where we get sort of like the kids moments of the Samson story. It's, it's incredible. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. Anybody ever done that before? Lately. Okay. But he he tore the lion apart with his bare hands like he would have torn a young goat, which is an interesting statement altogether. Like, how do you know what it's like to tear a young goat apart? Anyway, it doesn't matter. But he did not tell his father and mother that he had what he had done. Then he went and spoke to the woman because she seemed right to Samson. Verse 8. After some time, he returned to marry her. He left the road to see the lion's carcass, and there was a swarm of bees with honey in the carcass. Everybody say gross, right? Even grosser. He scooped some of the honey into his hands and ate it as he went along. You should underline that. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them and they ate it, but he did not tell them that he had scooped the honey from the lion's carcass. This is April 1st, apparently. Now, we have some major problems here. Why? Remember, he's a Nazarite. What do Nazarites commit to? What is their vow? Nothing from a vineyard, not even to be around a vineyard or close to one. Don't cut your hair and don't defile yourself by eating anything from a dead carcass. He does two of these. Two-thirds of his vow is completely gone at this point. He goes to Timna to see this woman who's a Philistine. She's in a vineyard. So he goes to a vineyard. Problem number one. Problem number two, he scoops honey out of a dead lion's carcass. Not only is that not sanitary, it's wrong for him to do. And then to cap it all off, I mean, this sort of speaks into the character of Samson and who he is. To cap it all off, he takes some of that honey, not unlike on like April Fool's. I saw people taking Brussels sprouts and dipping them in chocolate and then giving them to their kids for, you know, you know candy. And they obviously were grossed out by it. Not unlike that, there could be sort of this sort of devious thing going on. He takes this honey and gives it to his parents. But didn't tell him, oh, by the way, I, I scooped this out of a dead lion. So much wrong with this. But here's the reality of it. Samson is in the wrong place, and he's doing the wrong things. Warren Wiersbe said this, When Samson ate the honey from the lion's carcass, he was defiled by a dead body. And that part of his Nazarite dedication was destroyed. In fact, two-thirds of his vow was now gone, for he defiled himself by going into the vineyard and by eating food from a dead body. Not a great start. What is he doing? He's disregarding the commands of God. And we have to see that the commands of God are put into our lives as guardrails to protect us, not to make our life more miserable. Think of it this way. Think about the times where you've disobeyed God. How many have ever disobeyed God? Let's just all get on the same page here, right? If you're not raising your hand, you're lying. Welcome to the club. All right, here we go. We have to say that when we do that. It's sort of a preacher thing. Think about the times when you disobey God. Listen, at some point down the road or even immediately, you regret that to a point where it's just not going well for you. You immediately start to feel the consequences of your decision. Now, the, the physical consequences may not come right away, but you are now on a path and that disobedience towards a life or a moment or a situation or a decision that's not going to go well for you. And that's the path of disobedience. That's the predetermined destination for a disobedient life. If we disregard God's commands, then we remove those guardrails from our lives. 
And listen, I'm saying this to, to me as much as I'm saying it to you. It's something we always need to be reminded of. Here's why we have a flesh and a desire. Sin is always there. We are always battling it. We learn this in the New Testament where it says that what, what, what we struggle with comes from us. Our flesh, it's always there. And so what do we do? We, we, we work and we labor. Because we know something about what God has done for us, he's given us grace, now we work and labor to, to stay on the path of God's commands. We do what the writer of Proverbs implores us to do, to guard our heart for it's the wellspring of life to guard that central thing about us that keeps us on the path. And that's our walk with God. To feed our spirit, not our flesh. The more we feed the flesh, the more the flesh will show up. The more we feed the spirit, the more the spirit will show up. Well, Samson is disregarding what God has commanded him to do. To take this vow, you're going to be a Nazarite, you're going to be a, a, an example, and you're going to do some incredible things but here's what I need you to not do as a Nazarite. Don't touch anything from a grape. Don't go into a vineyard. Don't cut your hair. Don't eat anything from a dead carcass. And here this deliverer is already doing those things. And so not only did Samson disregard the people in his life, not only did he disregard the commands of God, but he also disregarded his purpose. He disregarded the purpose of his life. Now, here's what we know. We know that the purpose of his life is that he would be uh, this, this, this symbol, this figure, this voice of God to deliver the people out of oppression to the Philistines. And he makes this vow, and this vow causes him to stand out. He's, he's, he's outside of uh, you know, the culture, if you will, in a way that makes him different. And so he's been set apart. It's the point of this vow. He's been set apart for a reason and for a purpose, but he disregards his purpose by now starting to sort of play games with what God has given him. He abandons his purpose, but now he's sort of interacting with the Philistines in a way where he's like using his gift, he's using what God has blessed him with for his own game, his own amusement. And so here's what people want to know. They want to know, why are you so strong? That's what they keep asking. Samson, why are you so strong? And so they, they, they keep bugging him, and they keep asking him, and they keep asking him. And here's what he decides to do. Chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. Here's what he decides to do. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can explain it to me during the seven days of the feast and figure it out, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes, but if you can't explain it to me, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. He starts to play games, and he makes a deal. You figure it out, and then I'll tell you. And what proceeds from that is a story made for Hollywood. If you told the story right, it would be almost unbelievable, the things that took place in the life of Samson. When Samson makes this deal, his wife is threatened, and his wife's, wife is threatened uh, and, and basically forced to go get him to tell her what the riddle is. And so she does, and he, he tells her. And then she tells them, Samson gets angry, and he kills 30 men, sends his wife off, and she's given to another. Later on down the road, Samson decides to go back to his wife. And when he got there, he realized that his dad had given his wife to one of their companions because his dad certainly believed that Samson hated her. So Samson gets angry. Now he's mad at the Philistines because he recognizes that the Philistines were the ones that threatened her, and they wouldn't even be in this situation to begin with had they not threatened her. So what does Samson do? Samson goes and he catches, all you hunters out there, 300 foxes. Then he takes those foxes and he ties their tails together in pairs. And then he fastens a torch to the tails of the foxes. And then he turns the foxes loose into the Philistines' fields, burning up all their grain and all their livestock. Then the Philistines come back because they're angry that Samson did this. And they go to his father and they go to his wife and they burn them alive. 
Samson gets angry, and the Bible says in, in the story that Samson slaughters many of them. And then he goes to hide in a cave. And while he's hiding in that cave, people come up to him. 3,000 people go to this place in Judah to go get him. The people of Judah go to get him, and they tell him, listen, Samson, you got, you got to stop this, man. we got to do something different. And now Samson agrees. He says, listen, if I let you do this, you are the ones that are going to take my life. Don't let them do it. All the while, Samson's got a plan. So they tie Samson up. They bring him out to the 3,000 men. Samson breaks the ropes, and he kills 1,000 of them with the jawbone of a donkey. You cannot make this stuff up. I mean, that is a, an outrageous story. But it's all caught up in this man who's disregarding the purpose of his life. Now he's caught up in this feud for the wrong reasons. His battle with the Philistines are not because of God's purpose and plan to deliver them from oppression. His battle with the Philistines is he's angry at them because he told them a riddle and they coerced his wife into telling them the secret of his story, which wasn't the real secret. He was playing games with them. And so here's what we learn about Samson. Again, Samson uses the gifts of God that he had been given for divine purposes for prideful pleasure. Samson let the desires of his flesh dictate his actions, totally disregarding God's commands, the people in his life, and the purpose of his life. But it gets worse. <laughs> Chapter 16 begins to tell the end in this sort of life that is heading down a path of destruction. His wife is dead. His father is dead. Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute and went to bed with her. Not a great beginning, all right? Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the Sork Valley. Verse 15 of chapter 16. How can you say I love you, she told him, when your heart is not with me? This is the third time you have mocked me and not told me what makes your strength so great. Here we go again. Delilah is now for the Philistines trying to find out what makes him so strong. Well, he begins to tell her riddles. He continues to tell her stories, but lies. He says, listen, here's the deal. If you take my hands and you bound them up in this way, then... then my, my strength goes away. That's the source of my strength. She does that. She yells to the Philistines. They come running in. He breaks the ropes. Well, that's red flag number one. He's with the wrong woman, by the way. And this happens over and over and over and over. But here's the thing. He loved her. So the events that unfold, while we read it from this angle, Samson's caught up in, in a desire. And so he loves her. And so regardless of how many times she betrays him, he stays there. Verse 16, because she nagged him day after, that's a whole other sermon, by the way, but because she nagged him day after day and pleaded with him until she wore him out, he told her the whole truth and said to her, my hair has never been cut because I am a Nazarite to God from birth. If I am shaved, my strength will leave me and I will become weak and be like any other man. And here's how Samson's life ended. His hair was shaved, his eyes were gouged out, and he was placed to entertain the courts of the Philistines. And that's where we get that story, where they place him where he can touch these pillars, and he takes a lot of people out with his, with his life. A very tragic story that could have been a very, a very uh, a, a brilliant story, a life of of success, a life where God raised a man up and he obeyed God and did incredible things. But instead, Samson's life was caught up because he, he jumped outside of the guardrails that God has placed in his life. And the narrative of this story, the thing that we glean from it is to not live the same life Samson lived. And the, 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 the action points are, are obvious. Let me give you three things really quick. One, let godly people insulate your life. Listen to godly people as they give you guidance. I would say to you that when you're wrestling with a situation, go to a godly man or woman first. 
When you're given advice, whether it be at work or at culture, whatever, you got a, a financial decision or a marital decision or you got to make a decision with kids and you're struggling with it, whatever it may be, go to a godly man or godly woman first for advice. You're struggling with marriage. You need to go to a counselor. Find someone who believes the word of God to guide you through the challenges of a married life. Make financial decisions. Maybe seek out someone who you believe is a godly man or woman to help guide you in making these decisions. Whatever it may be, you're struggling with sin. You don't run to the world. You run to God. And God has put people in our lives to guard us and guide us. And so let godly people insulate your life. Number two, let godly commands guide your life. God's word tells us not to do it, we shouldn't do it. We should see these commands as a way to guide us down a direction of holiness and righteousness and to protect us from this fallen, broken world that's constantly going after the things of God. And so we need to see God's commands differently than maybe we have seen them in the past. And number three, let godly purpose Define your life. If I've said this once, I've said it a thousand times. Everything that God gives us and blesses us with is not meant for us to just sort of hoard it and keep it to ourselves. Everything God gives us is meant to be leveraged towards the advancement of his name. In this case, God had given Samson gifts The purpose of those gifts was the glory of God. In our case, God has given us Christ. Christ dies on the cross for us so that we can be made right with God. And now we get to be the conduit because we believe in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And we've confessed that. We've made that our confession. We've followed him in obedience and baptism. We have joined him in the local church. And now we are a part of an army who gets to be the conduit to take the gospel to the world. And everything God gives you individually, everything, God wants to bless you, yes, but he wants you to leverage it towards the advancement of his gospel. And so what does that mean? That means we are a Christian before we are anything else. Everything about us in our Christian life, it defines everything else in our lives, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a doctor, whether you do landscaping, whether you clean houses, whatever it is that you do, Everything in your life is given to you and meant for you to now leverage towards the advancement of the gospel. And when we do that, that defines our lives. And so this morning, we, what's the point of it all? The point of it all is to see the life of Samson and to pay attention to what God has given us, these guardrails, and to live in between them. Because everything God does and everything God gives and every command is for our good and his Glory. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, God, I do ask you that we would just be reminded as a body of believers. God, I believe a timely reminder in the culture and time that we live in how important it is that we keep our eyes on you and that we submit to these guardrails that you've put in our life. And God, we're thankful for them. God, ultimately, we're we're definitely thankful for Christ. You've given us Jesus so that we can be made right with you. And God, that defines us and that guides our path. And so, Lord, I pray we'll be encouraged today and challenged. I would ask you this morning as we close out, some of you I know, listen, this resonates with you because you go, man, I've stepped out in one way or another. In this area of my life, I am not living in between the guardrails that God has set up for me. It could be you personally. It could be your marriage. You could be having troubles with children. It could be finances. It could be a specific sin. I mean, there's this guardrail that you've just sort of broken through, and now you're on a totally different path. I want to encourage you with two things. One, it's never too late to get back on the path. If you're a Christian, you repent. God is faithful, and he'll forgive you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness in the name of Christ. 
And so you can do that this morning. You can right there at your seat, just pray to God, call out to God, repent. You know the situation. But for some of you, you, listen, you need more. Yes, repent, yes, but now you need to seek some godly counsel as to continue to stay on the path. I want to encourage you, if that's you this morning, take one of those Red Connect with us cards, just fill it out, place it in one of those black boxes. We'll call you, and we'll help you in any way we can. Or maybe you don't want to call us, you know somebody. There's a godly brother or sister in this church, in your community group, that you know. Go to them, talk with them, spend time with them. Don't disregard the people in your life. Don't disregard the commands of God in your life. And hey, listen, don't disregard the purpose. Walk out of these doors today and see yourself as a missionary into this community. Leverage this week as we go into Easter to invite someone with you to explicitly hear the truth of a risen Savior as we celebrate as Christians on Sunday morning. Or this morning, maybe you're not a believer, you're not a follower of Christ, but you're wondering, how, how can I, what is this all about? I want to encourage you, if that's you and you're wondering how to be saved and what it means to be saved, what it means to be right with God, who is Jesus, whatever your question is, I want to encourage you to do one of two things. You can fill out one of those Connect With Us cards. You can write on the back and your pastor to call me. We'll call you and we'll talk to you. But listen, you don't have to wait. You can talk to someone today about what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus. I'm going to pray in just a second. We're going to respond in worship. Don will come up, give us some parting words. And when we're dismissed, I'll be hanging around down front. Would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus. God, we do love you. We do thank you. And God, as we go into this holy week, God, we're reminded of the, of the, the foundation of our salvation, grace and the gospel. And so what I pray as we head into this week, as we get ready to celebrate Easter, Lord, just do a work in our lives. We pray for every single church that preaches the Bible in this community for this coming Sunday as we all, as believers, proclaim the truth of a risen Savior. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.